Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me all okay? Yes. Okay. Good. Happy Wednesday. Everyone. Hopefully everyone is doing okay today. We've had a good hump day. <laughs> Hold on, let me get on camera. Uh, hopefully everyone had a great hump day and you're staying hydrated. <laughs> I'm trying to stay hydrated. Like I am just like super thirsty. All right. So let me share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Beautiful. All right. So welcome to day three, our uh, last and final day of our travel request, uh, mastering your travel request process workshop. This is one of five in the series that we've been doing. So I'm gonna just start out with, uh, uh, I already said hello, just uh, let me know where, where you guys are watching from because I think there's a couple of new faces on here who haven't been with us the whole time. Um, I'm in Georgia. And if you have been watching with us this whole week, I'm glad to have you on the last and final day, but I have saved the very best for last today. But before we jump right into that, let's do a quick recap of what we've gone over the last for a few days. So yesterday, we really focused on the conversation. So the types of conversations that are really going to help you close more deals, the pre conversations before, uh, before they become a client, and then uh, while you're sort of courting them, and then ultimately the conversations that you'll have after they say yes to the dress, so to speak. So uh, that, that was day two, day one, we really just kind of gave you a good overview of uh, the standardized way that you can run the acceptance of inquiries into your business and get them ultimately to close. So you will hear me say this often, um, but today is going to be all about don't create a thing without promoting that thing. And that's what we're going to focus on today is how to promote this thing that we've got in terms of our business, in terms of accepting uh, inquiries. But before we get started, I would love for anybody who would like to share in chat or come off of mute and tell me kind of what were some of your big aha moments that you had um, uh, this week that you would like to share uh, with me? Because I always love to hear what you guys have to say about that. Can you guys still see my screen? I think I may have messed up my share. All right, let me know what you guys, what, let me put the chat on so I can see what you guys are chatting about. All right, what, what were some of the big ahas that you had in terms of conversations or just in terms of the standardized, standardizing the way that you take in participants? And you can't tell me no one had an aha moment because you know I'm not going to let you guys go until you talk. <laughs> so, no aha moments. Everybody is cool. No one wants to say anything. Come on, ladies. I'll say something. All right. Great. Hi, my name is Lucira. Um, my biggest aha moment yesterday with you were the who. I have been struggling with that. Um, I've been struggling for a minute. And as you was just explaining and, you know, just going into detail about the who, the what, um, I, I love the analogy of the whole Dr. Seuss <laughs> because I'm a teacher. So that I really took that, but I, um, it, it made me sit back and think last night afterwards a little bit more of how I'm going to find my people and who is my people, who are my people. Yeah. Um, so that really was a big aha for me. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you sharing because I think we have a shy, a shy group this time, but Mashira, thank you for sharing. That often is a lot of what people who don't really think about travel in that way, they think about, I want to get people out of town and I want to get as many people out of town. So really 
Um, and now I'm never going to be able to today not think about Dr. Seuss because you said it because I do <laughs> who's your who and I probably need to get a shirt I'm going to get a shirt that says who's your who because that is the most important thing that you can figure out in your business is who do you service right we are a, we are in the service industry we are big servants to our uh, customer base and you know, I, I I do like Burger King, doesn't like me as much as I, I like it, but um, we really are, uh, we do provide it the way you like it, but you get to decide who you want to provide it to. So um, it's exactly. And, and just to jump in real quick also, when you broke down the all-inclusive, because I sell a lot of all-inclusive, Yep. but when you explained more about why why all inclusive why who what kind is it and who would want to be there you know so like again it just went back to the who um it just i i really i was in my car driving as i am right now and i literally was just like ah uh, uh, i'm i'm just saying oh my goodness speak directly to me i need it. so i really appreciate it well good again i thank you for sharing because i you know, I just want to like piggyback once, once you get the who, you know, we were in VIP right after the session too. It just makes everything like easier. It's like a lift off your shoulder. Cause now it's like, okay, if I'm talking to teachers, right. I'm going to use your example. If I'm talking to other teachers, right. I don't have to talk about construction workers and getting them out of town. I talk to teachers and what they're worried about and what they care about. Right. You being a teacher, you have a very unique perspective on what it's like to be a teacher. You're right about to come off of, you know, you're going into your, I can't, you know, all y'all can take the deuces from me and I'm getting ready to like, you know, really focus on me and my family and that breather. So you understand what that looks like. So if you decide to service teachers, you can speak their language. You don't have to worry about the person who's stuck in an office because that's not your concern, nor is it your tribe's concern. So um, many, many years ago, I, um, my BFF, she's now one of my really closest friends. She, she's a coach and she really teaches people how to build tribes. And I remember she had this course and it was uh, like rock your rock, like how to rock your tribe or something like that. And when that clicked for me, I was like, I'm building a tribe. Like I'm building a tribe. And that's what you guys are building. You're building a tribe of whoever your ideal client is. And if you can create a tight knit community of people that are in love, you know, they all have something in common, right? They rally around that, right? They rally around whatever that love or hate is. And then you get to pour into them and you are the tribe leader. Like you are the chief leader. You are whatever you want to call yourself and you get to take them all over the world. Like it's it, selling travel just becomes like, they're like, okay, where are you taking us this time? Where are you taking us next time? So really, if you consider yourself to be a tribe builder and really focus on the tribe, it's going to just be so much easier for you to do everything else. So thanks again, Mashira, for sharing. Um, and with Mashira's uh, uh, bravery, I will continue on the conversation. So let's uh, let's move on and talk about what's next. So just as a reminder, if any of you all are interested in simplifying the way that you get your travel requests, we do have a suite. We are going to do a little bit more of a demo as we relate that to promotion so that you guys can see some of the features of our Travel Pro Suite, but we are offering a 14-day free trial where you can get your account set up. Um, I actually think I need to move the share because I'm like moving, I'm, I'm over here and I can't see. So let me stop sharing for just a second and make sure that you guys can still see. Like I got like the share over here. My neck is like all turned around. So let me, let me, let me try that again. <laughs> I think I had it in the wrong spot. All right. Can you guys still see my screen? I remember what's on the slides, but I, I, <laughs> I don't remember as well as I used to. All right. So you'll get free account set up and then you'll also get a fast action call. So I want to know where you are in your business and we'll just make sure that wherever you are in your business, we actually get you set up in the right space. You'll get done for you travel requests set up. So that includes our surveys, our forms, our email templates, our funnels, 
our automations, all of that will come to you inside of your account for all of the phases that we have in our travel business that we've walked through, that we have available. And then you also get training. We start with the masterclass on how to get your travel request process set up inside of the system and personalize it. All you have to do is go to onlinetravelboss.com sweet success trial, and that will get you your account. So we talked about on Monday, the three shifts that you need to make to go from, or, you know, maybe even infuse the concept of being a high ticket seller, low volume customer worker or client worker where you need to make the shift. So we're now going to talk about the first three, the, the third shift. The first shift was really standardizing the way that you take in requests, the way that you operate the business so that you aren't creating an expensive customized model every time somebody submits a request. We want to standardize that wherever possible. We want to remove ourselves from the process wherever possible so that we don't get in the, in the way of our own success. That was day one and shift one. Shift two yesterday was really around making sure that we don't work with everybody. We know who our who is. We identify who that is. And then we build a offer and offers around where our people are. We don't sell the strangers. We try to have meaningful conversations with them. And today we're going to talk about how you develop offers that are client focused as opposed to transaction focused. And so this is really creating a service model within your travel business that will allow you to command high dollar and also help people get out of town in a unique way. So many of you all, what I'd love to hear from you all now is how many of you guys have other income streams beyond just commission in your travel business? How many of you all have service revenue as is as a part of your business model? So remember, one of the things that I talked about um, on Monday was I talked about this whole idea of being high ticket, right? So maybe you want to be high ticket, but your process is a low ticket process or the, the services that you provide are not high ticket, right? So how many of you have services and have income coming into the business beyond just commission that you're getting from the host, uh, from your suppliers? Let me know in the comments. Actually, I got to pull up the comments so I can see said comments. So let me see what you guys are saying. How many of you guys actually have additional income revenue streams coming into business? And I'm not really even talking about like you sell like, you know, hats and swag and that kind of stuff. Service income. How many of you have service income coming into your travel business now? Nobody, nobody's, nobody's got service income. Y'all are just all working on commission alone. That's it. Yes, so some people have service income, service fees, but I'm also thinking about adding uh, travel coaching. I love that. I love travel coaching. <laughs> I happen to love travel coaching. <laughs> but it, what's interesting, Danielle, is travel coaching, right? I mean, obviously travel coaching, training, travel advisors, but travel coaching, travel uh, coaching consumers, because consumers need travel coaching as well. I'm going to give you a really great example. There's this guy I follow because I follow everybody, right? Like, because I am a marketer. So I, I'm like on everybody's list. I see what they do. There's this guy and I, I would encourage you all to look at it because I get travel advisors. who are like, I'm tired of like taking in requests and I want to do something else. And maybe you're a teacher and you like to train and you like to do whatever. There's so many different ways to make money in this industry. His business, and I don't even think he's in the travel, like, I don't think his background's in travel. I think he's in, like, he's, he's a marketer, but the name of his business is just get out of town. Like go look him up on Facebook. It's called just get out of town. And what he does is he's got like thousands of people in his Facebook group. And what he does is he trains people on how to use points to get out of town. And like when I saw it a couple of years ago, I was like, that's ingenious. So 
you know, he sells courses on teaching consumers on how to leverage getting out of town through points. What you guys have before you, I, I've been telling you guys this all week long, is that you guys have before you a, you are a gold mine of information and people buy information. Access to information is limitless. Like you have ChatGPT, you've got, you've got internet, you've got just a plethora of information. And so what the information age has done is created an overload. What you have the ability to do now is to consolidate and present that information in a way that's meaningful for people. That's a service. So I always tell people, don't, th don't forget about the way that you, the information that we have in terms of suppliers, the way that we do our business, those are all consultative services that you can sell. So my whole point is, is that there should be a, a revenue stream in your business model that's beyond just commission. But we want to make sure that the services that we create are just transactional. You're not an agent, right? You're not somebody, and maybe you think of yourself as an agent, but you're not. You really are a professional service provider. So let's talk about what that looks like. So, you know, when I first even did these slides, uh, I, I think the first time I put these slides, I mean, literally, I've been putting these slides together for years, but when I first did that, you know, the whole idea of planning fees was very new to people back in 2018, 20, uh, 20 I think I started uh, talking about design fees. I just really, when I learned about it in 2016, I was talking about it and how I started charging. I started charging $25 because my upline, she was like, yeah, I charge $25. And I was like, I'm charging $25. If you charge $25, I'm going to charge $25, right? Because I'm sick of working with these yahoos that don't want to book trips with me, right? So how many of you guys felt like that? So I was like, I'm charging $25. And I'm telling you $25 a person. I still had sweat in my armpits. And I was like, that's a lot of money. Like, nobody's going to pay that. Like, you know, I was... So I, I, like, I was scared to charge that $25. I don't know if you guys are, and many of you guys are, because you're, you're not charging even that. Like, you're charging that, and I know some people are reimbursing that $25. And I remember the first time I did, I was like, yes, I'm worth it. Like, I was like, yes. And I remember the first time I did it, I charged $25 per person. And it was like $50. And I said it like under my breath really quick. And I was like, $50. And she was like, oh, okay, no problem. It was planning a, a destination wedding. I'll never forget this. It's planning a destination wedding. And that woman ran me through the ringer. She had me go back and forth. I must have did like, I don't know, 60 iteration quotes. Like, cause I was like, I'm charged, I'm getting 20, 50 bucks. I need to like do the most for this, right? She had me like do, at, you know, in one country and another country and like we just kept going around and around and she ultimately did it book, you know, I, she paid the 50 bucks, but I didn't have any structure around the service. I didn't have anything to do it and I was still scared to death to do it. My point is, is that that really is a model that you don't have to follow. Like, so I'm going to, I'm here to tell you, don't do what I did. Don't keep doing what you may be doing which is charge nothing or something as little as $25. Don't get me wrong, but literally it costs $25 to go to McDonald's now. I mean, this is like some 10 years later, $25 doesn't deter people, doesn't deter the Yahoos. Maybe 10 years ago it deterred the Yahoos, but $25 in and of itself is not going to deter or attract the right type of client. So the purpose of the design fee is not only to repel, but it's also to set the stage in someone's mind of what you do. At the end of the day, no matter what we say or think, right, there is a sense of, and this is just human psychology. I've read a lot of books around it. I've experienced it myself, but there is just something about the fact that costs, when, when I see something that costs, right, I am comparing what am I getting for that? And if you haven't defined that, that's probably why you're scared to say it. Maybe you have defined it. it, does, it my point is, is when I see something that is a higher cost of something, I immediately am trying to say, what am I getting for that price? So 
what we want to do is we want to create a service that isn't an agent service, right? Pick up the phone, make an order, right? You're not an Uber driver. You're not, somebody's not taking an order, right? So we want to make sure that we match the service and the value to the price that you ultimately want to charge and create value in what it is that we do. So you don't have to do this. You don't have to do zero dollars. You do not have to give away your services for free. You don't have to charge low dollars because people won't pay it. You don't have to be afraid to lose business. And you do absolutely do not have to refund the fees and apply it towards the trip. Okay. I want you to just throw that out the window too. You don't have to do any of that. This is why your agency needs to charge, particularly if you are a person who said on Monday, or you believe yourself to be a person that wants to have high, val high value, high ticket clients, right? And work with a lower volume of clients. You want to eliminate, you do want to, you want to scare away the quote only seekers, people who are like, yep, I just need you to run these numbers for me and validate that the internet Google search that I did was okay. You don't want to work with those people, right? So your design fee and your planning fee, just by virtue of the fact that you mentioned that you have that potentially gets those people away. You also want an additional stream of income. What I tell, what I will tell you is more money in your bottom line allows you to service your clients better. It allows you to show up better. It allows you to hire a team. It allows you to do so much more in your business so that you can be a better service provider to your business. So more money is not bad. And if you think that is, I need you to work on why you think that it's bad, but more money in your business allows you to be a better business owner. It attracts quality clients. And, and that's a fact. Right. I will tell you, um, and this may sound bad or not, but it, it's just a reality, right? I could charge somebody a hundred dollars for something and they will drive me to the ground on all of the things that they need, want to have in that thing. I charge a different person for the same service, a thousand dollars, right? And they are less likely to drive me to the ground, right? I don't know why that is, but that's just is because the person who's willing to pay a thousand dollars, they most likely understand that what you are giving them is a quicker and a better solution than them doing it themselves. I, I, don't, I can't explain why it, it is, but low ticket doesn't always attract. And you think, oh, well, I'm cheap. I'm cheaper. I'm going to get more people. That's not the way that that works all oftentimes. I'm telling you, I've been in the coaching business for a while. I've given same coaching services, done $50 versus a hundred, you know, a thousand dollars. And the $50 person will want everything under the sun, moon and earth. Right. And be like, well, I spent $50. The person at thousand dollars, they want their time back. They want the quickest way to whatever the solution is. And that's why they're willing to invest that thousand dollars. So same thing for you. You're the quickest path for them to get out of town safely with them, them having to worry about all of the things that take to get somebody out of town. Does that make sense? Get, up, get compensated for your expertise and your time upfront. There is no reason. And I, and I will, I will like I, every time I talk about this particular topic, I get on sort of a little bit of a soapbox, but there is no reason under the sun, moon, stars, whatever, that you need to be giving your services away for free. Not, not in 2024. You aren't an agent. You know, again, we call ourselves agent, but we are providing a service and in, in any other industry, specialized service providers get paid for it. So the act of designing is not the same thing as management of the booking. It is not the same thing as them, as you getting commission on the back end, right? The commission is between you and the supplier for referring clients to them. That has nothing to do with the client relationship and the work that you're doing on that. So don't mix the two. That may have been the case before, but I don't consider it to be the case now. And now officially Asta agrees with me, right? Because now last year they just officially said we should all be getting, uh, we should all charge design fees. 
All right. So I want you to feel empowered by that, ladies and gentlemen, that you shouldn't feel any kind of way by charging. You should charge and it should be a part of your model. What I will tell you is that this is really a mindset thing. So in VIP, I was talking to the people who are in VIP and I was like, and I've said this before in other trainings is, is that whatever you decide to charge, it should put like a smile on your face. Like, like it should be like a devilish smile too. You should be happy to say the number. You should be happy to receive the number. So when you do the work, like you're not bitter. Like I, I have talked to so many travel advisors that are pissed off that somebody ghosted them. I don't care if somebody ghosts me. If you don't take my cert, like if you don't take my recommendation at the end, the fact that I've designed this amazing experience for you is already been paid for. Like, so I don't care. Like if you go, like, again, I love for you to go. I want for you to go, but again, I haven't mixed the two. So I'm not angry if you decide something comes up and you can't pursue it or whatever, because the service that you asked for, I gave it to you. And now we're going to go to a different stage, right? So you are professional. You're not an agent. So again, I don't care what you call yourself, but I need you to have the right mindset around what it is that you do. You need to, you need to, you need to put a value on your expertise. We spend a lot of time learning about a lot of different things in this industry. You have to stay up to speed on a lot of things in this industry, not only destinations, suppliers, country regulations, wars, <laughs> you know, airline, you know, airline, just like, you know, gosh, I know you guys are all following the, the latest debacle on the airline industry and, you know, what they're proposing, you know, what Congress or, you know, the Capitol Hill is proposing that advisors be responsible for. All of that is on our shoulders. And by you just worrying or getting paid on the back end of a deal, does not Oh, does it lend itself to the value or you getting paid for the value of the expertise that you have to acquire? Um, I'm a certified project manager and um, to renew my certification every year, I have to take 60 hours of continuing education, right? Think about how much education you guys have to take. You guys have just spent three days with me, right? An hour and a half. And if you're in VIP, you spend another hour with me learning about how to run your business. This is just the running of your business, not to mention all the supplier training that you do, right? All, if you've got a CLIA, you've got to take their training. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do to maintain your bomb.comness, right? And so you need to put some value on that, put some respect on your own name, right? That's what you need to do. Don't worry about people who are gonna tell you no. Don't worry about people who do it themselves because what you really ought to do, if you're worried about do it yourself first, maybe you need to create a class for them and sell that class because people will buy that too, right? I'm literally telling you, I don't know why. I remember when I was in the hair industry, I, I used to say this and I see it now like, 15 years later, I was like, every salon, oh, like every stylist should, should like create a class. And now that's all I see are stylists who sell courses on how to braid, how to do this and how to do that, right? And the travel advisors, same thing. There is no reason why you can't package up your knowledge and create a $50, $75, $200, or $400 training package and sell that to consumers they will buy it and do it yourself first they do it look at look at youtube university right <laughs> you people love to learn about stuff and if you are a specialist in things they would love to learn about what you have to say about a thing so here's the opportunity that you have is since you are a professional and if you shift your mind on the thought that you are a professional service provider, right? I'm gonna give you even some additional context to canoodle on this week, right? The rest of the week is you have the risk of a professional service provider. You can be sued like a professional service provider, right? So if something goes wrong with the client's trip, right? They fall, they break an ankle, they get sick, and you've omitted that, they you, there's grounds for a suit. Now, do I think it's right that they would do that? But you could be sued. Do you know why? Because you provided the advice. That's a profession because you're considered a professional service provider and the grounds, like suits aren't like, it doesn't mean that it's legitimate or not, but you 
have the risk of a professional service provider, right? So that means you need to have your ducks in a row. So you've got all this risk that you're bearing just because you don't charge doesn't mean that you're still not thought of that when it comes to the law, when it comes to your risk exposure. So get paid like a professional, right? But that's all I would say. If you're going to, if you've got the risk of a professional, you should get paid like a professional. And the great thing about it is you get to define the structure. There's not like any laws or there's not any body of people saying that we can only charge so much, that you can only make so much. It's up to you to decide. Now, you do have some constraints depending on which state you're in, right? If you're in California, if you're in um, Florida, right? You got to understand what the laws in those states, the seller of travel states say, right? But I still, and I've talked to some attorneys about this, there are still ways that you position your services that allow you to still be legal around that. Charge an agency fee for your expertise and a consulting fee for your expertise. You can also charge for ancillary services like airline only travel booking. At this rate with airline, you should be charging something for airline. <laughs> like you gotta have some sort of fee structure for ancillary services. I put airline, because we don't make any money. And if it is, it's pennies on the dollar for booking airline, but it is a pain in our backside to manage an airline booking. How many of you guys would agree with that? Like to manage international air travel is a pain to do, right? And we don't get any real compensation from the airlines to do such things. Non-commission and or low commission reservations, right? Hotels would be an example of that. So you know, very few hotels are paying greater than 10% commission on using them, right? Some, you know, some of them, depending on your host agency or consortium, maybe you get 12, 15%, but the commission is pretty low. Cruise lines are another example, right? The commission, if you're independent fully, you're probably at 10%. If you're with the host, you're at 16%, but even blended, that's still 12%. The point is, is that the commission on the back end to me is not equivalent to the work. I'm gonna just give you some numbers just from a, a booking that I'm doing. I'm doing an MSC cruise um, and I'm working with a, 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 a client who has um, a wheelchair, uh, has a scooter. Um, and so we've had to get all this stuff approved, right? I've had to like chase MSC down the commission on that booking is $562, right? I just looked at it today because I had to call MSC for the 50th millionth time on this booking. It's $562 for a $7,600 trip, right? I have done more work on this particular booking than I have done on a lot of the bookings I've worked on because of her unique situation. But on the front end, I got $1,000 on the front end. So ultimately, my total revenue for this trip is $1,500. But if I didn't have a service fee on the front end of that, I would expect to get $500. No, I'm sorry, it's $652 because I, I just looked at it. It was $500, but then I guess I got some commission. All right, $650, that, the amount of hours that I spent on this because it's a special needs. Again, it's not her fault. But my point is, is that if I didn't have a fee structure on that, $652 is what I'm looking at. And, and if she canceled, I may not have gotten that. Does that make sense, right? So my point is, is you got to look out for your bottom line, make sure that every deal that you do is profitable and it makes sense for your business and the work that you put in. We are consultants. We do itinerary building, custom travel, special needs consideration, right? Event, procurement, all of that. Those are all consulting services that you need to account for. And that opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, is what you have before you. So talking to a client earlier today, and you know, when we talk about profitability, one of the things that we look at is your fees, like how much fees. And so she's really talking about, she was talking to me about, well, Sunday, I tried to calculate my credit card fee and the number you gave me to look at, I'm still upside down $20. And I'm like loving it. She's got a spreadsheet. She's got it all broken out. I was like, you go girl. Cause like, I feel like, you know, I've had a great conversation. So she's actually looking at, cause she's doing river cruising and she's got the fees broken out and she does not want to be upside down on that. Right. So my point is, 
you have the opportunity to influence your numbers, so do it. Don't let it, don't let the opportunity slip by. I want you to think of the supplier commission as icing. How do you build a model that ensures that you get the cake? All right. So let's talk about some of the fees that you can be considering in your travel business. These are service fees. These are the like consulting fees that I'm talking about. These are service fees based on different ancillary services that I'm talking about. So, you know, airline ticketing, that's a good one. Domestic international tour packages, cancellation fees, air, um, air inclusive packages, accommodation only, rail, Frequent flyers, so if somebody's using frequent flyer points, I would charge them an additional fee for that because you know you're not getting, you're getting like zero to nothing on commission on the back end for that. Exchanges, car only, cruises, ancillary services that you may be doing, refunds, fit segments, short excursions, special coupons, all of this fee structure is within your control to create a schedule around. If you don't have a fee structure accounted for any some portion of that, that's an opportunity for you to add that to your business. So let's talk about some client focused fees, services that you can have in your business. Before I continue, how do you guys feel so much about what we're talking about so much now? 250 per person for international, you know, I don't blame you. I don't blame you, not one bit it. <laughs> no, not one bit it. I'll tell you, I think Melinda, you're saying it's horrible that yeah, six hundred and fifty dollars for the amount. Like I this this scoot, like I, I this is my first um accessible travel. And I'm telling you, if you guys are not in this space, like I really feel like there's a, an, an amazing opportunity for uh travel advisors who uh want to service a market that is an underserviced market and it, it is it is it has been the most stressful the things that you have to consider when dealing with accessible uh travel are things that i just i just never even knew like i think there's one advisor that i've seen in the marketplace i think her name is janine or janet who is a like she she is um she is accessible herself i think she's in a wheelchair and she's got an entire like travel advisor uh, space and she she specializes in that, but I just think there's a, a great opportunity there. All right, types of fees, consultation fees that you can consider um, here. And really, what is that? And this is really charging um, intended to cover your time spending on research, planning, booking, and managing your client travel upfront. So the types of examples that you can do event planning, um, so one of the things that, you know, most people think of when they think of an event is as though like I've got to, you know, at wedding destinations is an event, right? And you think, oh, well, I don't want to really do events, but even if you are organizing a group, you can consider that event. If they're doing, if they're gathering together, there's really an opportunity for you to do some event planning with them along with the resort, even if there's a planner on site. So all of the work that needs to happen before the person gets out, because the, the on-site planner doesn't do usually any of the work before they get out of town. So there's obviously some things that you can do. Anybody who's in the wedding destination space, I tell you, if you are charging at least 500 to 1,000 for getting somebody out of town for wedding destination, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like I, I need you to do the research because people will pay, people will pay exorbitant amount of monies to have this amazing event um, and pay for the helping and the planning of that. Trip designing. So, you know, I call it a design fee. Um, some people call it a plan to go fee. I like the word design because there is a, a bit of a design element to it. Itinerary planning creating standard itineraries, selling those itineraries as already done for you itineraries where they just have to pick from a collection or a catalog of itineraries is certainly something that you can do. Even just selling the itinerary where you give them a list of like you could sell those itineraries um, done for you itineraries that already have all the hot spots that they can consider and all they have to do is go and book it and you give them the plan, you know, sort of a pseudo training, so to speak custom trip planning you know we call it fit in the industry but literally every time that you have a 
a set of requirements that you have to build out something that is a custom. Anytime you use the word custom in any other industry outside of the travel industry is a premium. Why we don't charge for said premium is just beyond me. A lot of you are like, yeah, I want to do group travel because I'm sick of working with individuals. I'm like, that's because you're not pricing individuals correctly, right? If they're individual and they've got custom trip requirements, there should be some customization. So don't design like Expedia, design like a custom travel planner, right? Work with DMCs. Um, you know, we just have just a, just, you know, I'm very passionate about this. There's just so much opportunity for us to really position ourselves as, you know, um, boutique and customized um, uh, service providers. And we really do have the opportunity to take advantage of that. Group trip planning, you cannot underestimate if you are the, the trip planner, right? I don't typically charge for trips that I curate, right? Because you don't get to you don't get to dis you don't get to change that, right? You don't get to change that, and I've already built my profitability into that. But if I'm working with the group leader and I am creating a special group on behalf of somebody, that's a group trip planning. There's a lot of things that people don't take into consideration when it comes to planning a group, and we normally give away that service for free. Plan time off. I created this service many, many years ago. And, you know, in the month of January, there's uh, there's a holiday. It's called uh, Plan Your Vacation, like we're planning your vacation to celebrate. So I think it's the third Tuesday, in, uh, third Tuesday in January. And so the service that I created was I work with clients and we take a look at their entire vacation schedule, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, however much vacation that they have, they pl they pay the, the plan your time off, you know, fee. And that allows me to sit with them and we plan out their entire year's worth of vacation time, right? We plan out trips for them. We make sure they get them on the calendar and they effectively have this trip time that they can guarantee that they're going to, you know, not at the last minute, be uh, trying to scramble to get out for Thanksgiving. They have it all planned out. So that's a service that we've created. And we, um, we, we market that service. We used to market, not so much now, but we market that service and, and that's what people buy. So they buy literally a bulk of designing based on their vacation schedule, right? Or their vacation days. So we're maximizing their vacation days. When I, when I thought of the service I had um, back in 2016, um, I, I discovered the, the celebration day. And in that discovery, over half of the people in America, so I'm only talking about Americans, don't take their vacation time. They don't take their vacation. So that's a huge opportunity for people who plan time, right? Who plan vacations to offer this as a service, right? 50 per, 56, at this time, I haven't looked at the statistic recently, but 56% at that time, many years ago, don't take planned, don't take the vacation that is already on the book. So they don't have to go create the time off. They don't have to go beg for the time off. It's already a part of their benefit package. It's already a part of what they have allocated and they don't plan it. They don't plan it. They don't use it. Right. So here comes you, the expert, right? If I were, if I were focusing on the service and I had a particular who in mind, I'd be talking about what are you doing with those three weeks of vacation that you got? Like, do you have it? Our, we're already in month five. Like, right. You should already have Christmas plan. <laughs> you should already have Christmas plan. You should already be in spring break of next year. You got another three weeks coming next year. Do you already have that plan? So this service is a great service for all of you advisors on the call today to have in it your back pocket to start promoting to your who's. Make sense? Here's the keys to success. I've already said it. Do not create a thing without promoting that thing and don't promote a thing without tracking the thing. So let's talk about those keys and break it down. So the first step that you need to do is define an offer. So we're actually talking about paid offers, right? So these would be people, you wouldn't be making these offers right out the back to people who are completely strangers. 
you want to, you've got somebody who's a discovery, right? So somebody who's in a discovery call, they're not a complete stranger because they've already seen you. They've already decided to make this their, you know, they're, they're most likely ready to purchase a service because somehow they got to this space. What's that offer look like? So I'm going to pause and ask you guys, what do your offers look like? Right? So I think Danielle said that she's got a, um, let me look back and say, you, you've got fees for international. I think we talked yesterday. So every one of the VIPers are going to be charging for their design and planning fees. Do you guys have any other service offers based on what we've talked about? What, what appeals to you all right now? Can you, can you think about what kinds of offers you would like to create in your travel business? And I'm, again, I'm not talking selling travel. I'm talking about services that get people out of town. What kind of offers come to mind for you all right now. Because once you identify the what, what we wanna do is start to put together the elements of that offer so that it matches whatever price you decide for that offer. Does that make sense? I'm gonna say that again. You need to have the definition of the offer match the price. And again, that's gonna be all in your mind. So if you decide that you wanna charge $500 for your design planning fee, right? Your consultation services, whatever that number is. Because frankly, it doesn't matter what the number is. As long as you're comfortable with it and you've created an offer that has value to your who, they will pay it. The, the offer needs to have a description of it. You can't just say, I do, I, I give you some, I, I, I plan your trip and that's it. Right. It needs to be client centric. It needs to be what most of us who are new to doing this. And I, I, I have fallen into this trap as well. I'm talking about Sunday, right? You know, I've got, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. And, and it's not about them, right? When I first started talking marketing and talking about offers, it was like, it was talking about, and, and I'm going to use I'm going to use a trip as an example. We focus on, oh, it's category 4B, right? And it's, you know, 500 square feet. Nobody gives a shit about the square footage of their room. Nobody cares about that. What they care about is the fact that they need to unwind and they're all stressed out and they haven't talked to their husband in six months. That's what they care about, right? So the design, if I'm going to offer a design service and my who is couples, I'm going to talk about how I'm going to make sure that you and your boo are going to love each other when you come back. And my service all, is a, all about creating the love experience. You see the difference? I'm not talking about square footage. I'm not talking about characteristics that people don't care about and the offer isn't about the fact that I'm going to give them five and six quotes, although I'm going to talk about that in terms of what's included, but the description of the offer is going to speak to the who. It's going to speak to the why the person can't get themselves out of town and do it themselves. And if they are doing it themselves, why I can do it better for them based on what their needs are. So it's very client centric, the words that I'm using in my description. And I'm only talking about benefits that the clients care about. We as advisors, we want to talk about all of the features of the resort. We want to talk about the features of the travel. Don't get me wrong. Legally, if I was an attorney and an attorney was here, they would be like, you got to make sure that I and that T is crossed. But when it comes to describing my services, I'm not talking about those legal features. I'm talking about the service that Sunday is going to provide to the client that the client wants that they don't want to have to do themselves relative to getting out of town. So it's all about benefits. Why would they pay $500 to you? Right? Cause you're going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to worry about how the, the length of your scooter, how much it weighs. I'm going to get the approval, the mobility approval. I'm going to talk to the airline, the transportation company. I'm going to talk to the, the hotel, I'm going to make sure that you don't have to worry or pick up the phone and that you're going to safely get to wherever you want, right? So again, the benefits are going to speak to the client. What's included and excluded is going to make the attorneys happy, right? It's going to make the insurance company happy. So you want to bullet out those things that you include and don't 
um, cover. So in the what's included section, I'm specifically making sure that you understand that it's only three quotes or three iterations. We're not doing this for the next six weeks going back and forth. Right. We're not going, you know, you're not going to change the requirements and tell me, you know, we started with Italy and then we're going to start in, uh, you know, in in Africa. Right. You're going to it's only going to cover one one destination or location or co-location. Right. So I'm going to specifically create boundaries so the expectations are clear and I'm going to tell you what it doesn't include. Right. So that there's no misunderstanding and you can't say, well, I didn't know that this is going to charge, it was going to be more or whatever, right? Um, what are the terms? I'm going to be specific. I'm not going to hide behind the terms. I'm not going to hide behind the fine print. I'm going to let you know what, the, what that fine print is up front. Nothing makes a client angrier than you surprising something to them that you should have said up front. So the terms are super clear. I'm going to make sure that they understand the price. I'm going to understand and make it easy for them to buy, right? These are all things that you've got to do as a service provider. You got to make it easy for them to swipe their card. You got to make it clear for them about what they're getting and what they're not. So there's no ambiguity. All right. Second thing is, so once you know the what, right, you know the who, you know the what, now we need to promote it. So let's talk about what that promotion looks like. Really a couple of things that I want you to do. How many of you all right now promote your design services? If you're charging a fee, how many of you all have an active time every month, every quarter that you talk about your design process and the fact that you, you, have, a, you have a service that designs amazing trips? How many of you guys do that? All right. If you're not on purpose talking about it, then you're not really giving people one, you're not qualifying people to let people know, hey, yeah, I have a service. And with that service comes, obviously, right? If you talk about a service, people, people aren't silly, like that, you know, some people are silly, but they're generally not stupid. And they know that if you talk about a service that has all of this value, there's a price to that, right? So talk about it on purpose. Don't be afraid to talk about the fact that you design and you have a service that, 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 that you offer this, this amazing um, value for, right? And why it's a value to your clients. So you wanna schedule that conversation, that promotion on purpose. We literally have a promotion cycle, not only for our trips, but our services as well. So everything leads to our service, which is our service is the design. To get in my world, you have to book a, a, a sales call, call the discovery call, right? And then I'm going to qualify you, confirm and make a decision if I want to extend the service to you, but everything that I do is leading to that call. Does that make sense? So all of my leads are leading to that. And I'm promoting that in ads, organically, everything is leading to this service, right? Which is, and the sales call, that is the very thing right before the service, which is in order for me to sell it to you, I got to qualify you and confirm and decide I want to sell it to you. So everything is leading to that. So that's what the second bullet really is around is all things are leading to the service is leading to the question of how I qualify and confirm that you're the right person for me to even extend the service to. So there's always a call to action. And that call to action is the very first, th the very thing to the right of the service, which is the call, right? So before I get you to a call, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to let you know that I want you to fill out an inquiry form. Before the inquiry form, I want you to know that I'm the bomb.com that you want to submit an inquiry form, right? So all of the calls to action that I have in our business is focused on that process. We do an inquiry, we do a sales call, we close them on the service, we do a proposal, we close them on the booking. Does that make sense? So everything leads to that. So as long as the process is clear to me, I don't have to worry about what to do. So we're always promoting what? Inquiries. We're always promoting, you need to submit an inquiry. You want to 
submit an interest form. We're giving you opportunities to do an interest form. And then periodically, we're hard promoting the service. Does that make sense? Like, hopefully you guys are sort of seeing that picture is once you understand the process, then you can decide where do you want to focus your efforts? But when it comes to selling something, there's always a hard sell. There's always a promotion that we're doing that's doing a hard selling to the people who are already close to us. I'm always reminding you, hey, you have an opportunity to buy now. You can buy now. And this is right. So that is a promotion cycle that we're doing around that. All right, where do you do this, right? Where do you promote? We all know that we promote in social media, right? But what do we promote? The reason why it's so hard for you guys to find success in social media, if you feel that way, is because you don't, you're, you don't have a who. Most of the time it's because you don't have a who. And then you don't have a what. And then you're just trying to sell something and you're hoping it sticks to the wall, right? You get these packages and you're like, okay, you know, um, I, I don't even remember what I read in my email, but somebody's got some, I think it's M M MSC, has got this last, you know, drinks deal. And I'm like, I'm going to start promoting my drink deals. And then you just throw it up on social media, but you haven't connected the dots to your who, like, are, are your, like, so if the drink package is, is, is what's being promoted this week on, you know, said cruise line, you know, are your people drinkers? Like, do they love to party? How are you making that connection to them? So just in and of itself, you promoting some deal that doesn't make the connection to your who and why they want to take said deal is also why social media is not good. You're also doing blanket promotion to on social media without a consideration of who your who is, right? You're trying to sell you're trying to sell your stuff to strangers and it's not to your BFFs. I'm only doing like hard selling to people who know me, right? So like that, that's just a fact. Like I'm selling to people who already know, like, and trust me. I'm not trying to sell to people that don't know, like, and trust me. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to have a meaningful conversation with them so they can like know, like, and trust me, all right? Signature, um, where, where to place? In your signature. And this literally in the salutation in your email, in your email. So we put that in our signature. I'm going to show you that in just a second. But in the signature of my, um, in my email is a link to where I show up. I want you to go download, like join my Facebook group. I want you to go download my offer. I want you to go download my stranger offer. Because again, I don't want you, I want all things leading to the place that I'm going to be at. I'm going to be on my Facebook page. I'm going to be on my YouTube channel. I'm going to be in those places. So my signature includes the call to action that I want them to take. Other offers lead to that. And what that means is I showed you guys a couple of days ago, and I'm going to show this to you in just a second too, is the thank you page of the, of the request that, that, that last page, the fourth page in that funnel is an opportunity for you to say, Hey, do you want to book a call? Hey, do you want to, do you want to download, you know, the special guide that I have, right? So if I have an offer, let's say I'm doing a signature trip, I'm doing a group trip, the thank you page is going to probably have another trip that they can buy into or another upcoming trip that they can go into. So other offers are great places to also put your 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 design your design service or any service or another offer so you're just always thinking about where can i put another way for people to opt in or get whatever it is that you have to offer so we're talking about services so i'm always going to find if i'm selling or positioning something there's always another part two. Does that make sense? There's always a part two and service and or a thing is always in that part two. That's called an upsell, a downsell, a, a, a cross sell, but that's what we're doing. So other offers are another place to get part two of another offer. YouTube description. So if you're in YouTube, in your videos that you're doing, putting a link to your stranger offers, putting a link to a design call, your request process, all of those descriptions, your um, descriptions on your social media pages should lead to a link uh, to uh, get your stranger offer. If you're a writer, blog, call to actions are great places to do that. 
there really is a whole strategy on uh, blogs. If you read anybody's blogs, you'll see like links to offers, calls to actions, called out in there. So, you know, if you are a writer and you're like, I don't necessarily Sunday want to promote via video. I respect you on that. I'm telling you, you're missing a great opportunity. But if you are a writer, you got to be something. You got to be a writer or a video or like, that's just all it is. You got to be one of the two because that's the way we're in the online space. So you don't always get to meet people. So if you write called to actions in your written way, so in emails, in blogs, on social media posts, you would have some sort of call to action that's going to lead to that service or the step that's going to get them to that service. Social media posts, I've already mentioned that. All right. So we always want to track a thing. So what did I say? You want to have a thing, you want to promote that thing, and then you want to track the thing. And so really the tracking, you don't need to track everything. So we're going to really talk about some key metrics that you need to be tracking when it comes to your travel request process. So let's talk a little bit about those things. These are key performance metrics that are important. If you want more bookings in your travel business, these are key metrics for you to be tracking as it relates to that process. The first is the number of requests that get submitted. How many requests are you getting every month? If that's not a number that you're tracking, you should be tracking it. Because again, if you know how many you want, you need to know how many are coming in. That's number one. Number of discovery calls. So if discovery calls are part of your process, again, to me, discovery calls is just another way of saying a sales call. How do you close them into your design fee or close them to the next phase? And that's going to be done through a discovery call. How many calls are you getting booked? So they go from requests submitted to discovery calls. People could schedule calls all day long, but how many people have you had not actually show up to the call? Right. When I first started doing calls, I had a really high no-show rate. That's because I didn't have a reminder sequence. So what I had to learn is, is I had to have a, a mad reminder automation sequence to get people to show up to the calls. So we track how many people book a call and how many no-shows and how many shows we have. Because if you get if you get a calendar full of people that don't show up and you're not tracking it, it could be just as simple as you need to maybe add SMS to the process, right? Maybe you need to do text messaging to the process. We found that adding a text message component to our automations increased our show up rate. Adding, like literally adding a pretty much seven touches before the call increased our show up rate. You would think, oh, I don't wanna bug people that much, but people are busy, right? The more you remind them, the more apt that they're going to be. Like I was talking to my dentist because my dentist has a mad show up game, like a reminder game. I literally sent like 15 different reminders through email and text message. I was there. Not only was I there, I was on time. Right. And we're no different. People are that busy. And I talked to the receptionist and she's like, yeah. She says, people will come in and they're like, I didn't get a reminder. She'll be like, she'll look at them and she'll be like, really? You didn't get a reminder? All right. Same thing with you. Don't think that it's too much. It's not. Like it literally, people in this day and age need that kind of reminder. So making sure it's okay to get bookings. Like if you look at your calendar and you got a bunch of bookings, but then you realize that people are just booking and they're not showing up, then that's that point sort of an opportunity for you to improve. We track the, the amount of revenue because it's a, it's a trackable item in, in, our, um, in our business. So it's you could cut invoices all day long, right? But if nobody's paying those invoices, there's a problem, right? So you want to not only just track that you, somebody said yes to an invoice, but you want to also track how many paid invoices you've got and how many invoices that you ultimately end up voiding or end up in the no pay, right? Because that's going to indicate that there's an opportunity for you to improve as well. These are the key metrics. And then obviously the last metric, I didn't put this here, but the last metric is how many bookings that you ultimately get. But obviously you guys know, because that is one of your key metrics. So you want five bookings per quarter, per month is what you guys said. That's one of the key metrics that you do. But all of these things beforehand is how you get the bookings. Does that make sense? Like if you're not tracking all of these pre-booking activities, 
it makes it so much harder to actually get the booking. So let's talk really quickly around how do you do that in a system? Like how many of you guys are tracking all of these things in your business right now? Let me know in comments. How many of you guys are tracking right now all of these different things in your business? Not me. All right, not me. Okay. All right. And so some of you are like, well, I don't do fits. I do group trips, right? And so in the group trip training, right, which is our, it's coming up in a couple of months, we'll be doing that again. The same set, you you got different metrics, but there still are key metrics that you should be tracking because group trips, you do all the design work on the front end, but now you ought to be tracking like how many interest, interest, um, leads are you getting interested right so you should be running different marketing campaigns so your metrics are going to be different when you're tracking group trips that you curate versus when you're doing custom fit so if custom fit group leader trips is a part of your business model these are really good metrics for you to do so a lot of you said not me you're not doing that so let's just sort of talk through what the workflow looks like inside of a system so let me know if you guys can see the screen that I'm moving over. Can you guys see this dashboard? Are you seeing that? Are you seeing the dashboard? Yes, perfect. All right. So what we've done inside of uh, Travel Pro Suite is, is we've created, like we've created all these automations and we've created all this workflow, blah, 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 right? So I'm not going to go over all of that, but really what we've done is we've taken all of the stages of the travel requests and we've created what is referred to as a pipeline. So I'm just going to show you the pipeline and the stages inside of our pipeline. So you've got your inquiry submitted. We've got your booked discovery call, your design fee research, your, you know, we, we recommend that you create a trip because again, every deal is a trip. Uh, every trip is a deal. We actually, you know, I've got a whole training around how you actually determine profitability for each of these. We create the proposal, we present, and then we get a approval. So we're actually tracking each one of these stages and we're moving through automation your trips based on different triggers. So there's a few that you have to manually do because we were afraid to do it for you, but let's talk a little bit conceptually around that. So those are the stages in step one, and that's where we're talking about right now. So in stage in, in stage one, somebody's going to submit, and I'm going to remind you kind of what that workflow looked like, right? So your client is going to submit a request. So remember, we sh I showed you on Monday this sort of request workflow, right? Client's going to come to a landing page and then they're going to go and they're going to fill out a, a, a request form and then they're going to go to book an appointment and then they're going to get the thank you page, right? So this is what the client sees. But behind the scenes, what happens is somebody fills out a request and they drop into this queue, okay? So when we talk about, so you see here, I've got two leads that are in this queue. I've got two leads that are in this queue. I've got one lead that is in this queue. And as I move along, I've got different, you know, I've got different people in different parts of the journey. And that's what's really important for you to be tracking is how many people over time are making it to the different phases of your journey. Because at the end of the day, you can't get to the end of the journey without all the steps before it can, okay? So that's what I'm saying in terms of when I'm talking about these key metrics, we're looking at requests submitted. So we're looking at this first one. We're looking at how many of these are we getting that are actually moving to the booked discovery call, right? Because if there's a problem here, that means I'm getting submission, but nobody's meeting with me. We do this automation for you in terms of every submission that comes in, we're checking to see if they booked a call. And if they didn't, we're sending out reminders to them automatically. We're sending out reminders to your clients automatically. We'll send out three reminders and you're not doing any work. 
Meaning like you shouldn't start designing the trip. You shouldn't start thinking about it because you need to have this call with them. You need to talk to them and find out what their requirements, get the opportunity to confirm them, qualify them, decide if you want to move forward. So we're doing this sort of automated work for you. So if they submit and don't book, we're sending out email reminders. We could add on SMS. You can add that on here until they book. If they don't book, we send you a reminder after so many tries to let you know that they didn't book a discovery call. That's when you would want to insert yourself in. Then you conduct a discovery call. The one thing that we don't do is we don't move this to design fee because we didn't want to make the assumption that you automatically are going to charge. So we ask that you move the person into design fee yourself. So what happens here is once you move a person into the design fee, and you set this, there's a little bit of setup that you have to do it after an hour of them sitting in this stage, it'll automatically send an email out to your client and say, Hey, the call was really great. We're super excited to work with you. And like a minute later, it sends the invoice. You don't have to worry about cutting or creating the invoice. It automatically creates the invoice for you. I'm going to show you with one of that looks like I did this earlier. So we don't have to move it forward. So this is that client record and what it does is it automatically sends this email that says it was a pleasure meeting with you, having the discovery call with you and talking with you and to let them know, hey, an invoice is going to be coming. We talked about the invoice. You're going to get an invoice for the design fee. It's going to cover the trip planning fee. You're going to also get regular updates after you take care of the invoice. That's the email that goes out first. And again, we have a wait statement that's about an hour long, just, just in the event that you want to backtrack and you don't want to necessarily do that. We give you about an hour to do that. And then immediately afterwards, we send the invoice on your behalf. And so I don't think I clicked it. Uh, so here is the actual invoice. So this is an email that goes to the client and the invoice goes out, invoice amount, you'll set up your invoice template, you'll, the client will get it, they'll have the ability to click on the invoice and pay it. Again, you don't do any of the work until you get the notification that it's paid. So they'll get the invoice, they'll, you know, you'll set this up, you'll personalize this process for your own business. They'll pay the invoice and then you'll get notification to go to the next stage in the workflow. So once this invoice is paid, it'll move them to the research and design fee. So all of that automation is done. You don't have to really do anything except for set up your invoice template, decide on how much money you want to charge. Um, and then it, uh, it works just like magic. It'll move, uh, it'll do all of this, the automations that we have built for you. These three, we talked about this earlier in the week that these three are really your own process, right? I don't know which suppliers you work with. I don't know what you're doing in the design and research fee. We absolutely are going to recommend that you do some sort of trip profit. Uh, sheet, but you actually need to move it once it hits here, you'll need to move it into the create proposal stage. Once you do the create proposal, actually, if you go and create the proposal, it'll move the, the, the opportunity, the trip automatically here. And what I will tell you is our proposal builder, many of you guys are using Travelfy and you, you love Travelfy and you're, you, you don't want to leave it. And I'm not really trying to convince you to leave Travelfy. If you love Travelfy and all that Travelfy stands for or any other itinerary builder, I say continue to use it. I'm not really trying to convince you of that. But what I am trying to convince you of is making sure that you mitigate your risk by creating a proposal that has all of the necessary proposal elements in here. So as a part of this training, what I've done is I've created a proposal template um, for you all to create. And I think we actually have the feature now that I can um, share this with you all. But what we have is a proposal template that has sections that every proposal in your business need to include. And some of you may or may not have this when you build a travel uh, fi itinerary, but at minimum, your proposals need to have these sections. So one of the trainings that's in the master, your travel uh, master class that I have is what are the, those components of the proposal that every proposal needs to have, right? 
your daily itinerary, your rates, how you need to break that out, right? The amount, what's included, excluded, testimonials if you decided, your terms and conditions, and the ability to get a traceable signature here. Our system allows you to actually get that. So if you're using DocuSign, PandaDocs, or anything else to get an electronic signature, we actually provide the ability for you to capture a signature and actually get a signature, an electronic signature page that has the IP address and gets the legal confirmation that your client signed the proposal. When it comes to chargebacks, and did the client authorize the payment? This kind of risk mitigation is what you wanna have in place. And so our system does that for you in terms of having a formal proposal process that you wanna follow. So we have a template that you can create and then there's a process. We don't have the time for me to walk through the, the actual process, but we do have a process that you can do. So this is under templates, but underneath the proposal, what we do is we have a proposal that's in draft. Once it goes from draft, it goes for waiting for signature. The client will get it. You can send that to multiple people to get signed. They'll get the signature. They'll each get their opportunity to sign. That'll come back. And then ultimately you'll get notified once the signature has been, um, once the proposal has been approved. That then lives with the client record and you have all of that in one system. So that is what we're doing here. And so once the client moves into the proposal phase, then in the trip record, it's also moving into proposal approved. So once you create that proposal, it's gonna look here move it to the create proposal phase, and then you are going to move it to conduct a follow-up once you've got the scheduled appointment. And then if the proposal gets approved by your client, it'll move here and that ends the process. The whole point of showing you this is that I know that you guys are using other systems. I am not ignorant of that because I've worked with many of you with the other systems that you're using. I know you're using TravelJoy. I know that there's Turn out there. There's all of these other systems. What we have done for you in the Travel Pro Suite is really thought through the standard way you can do business and then give you access to modify and customize that even further inside of your travel business. All of these automations are already built. You don't have to build them out. What you do have to build is customize some things in the system so that it's personal to you. you got to upload, upload your logo. You've got to have your business information in here. You've got to make some decisions about what you want to have on those landing pages and those um, the request funnel. You've got to make some decisions about what you want to have on the form above and beyond what we've got for you. But in terms of thinking through the movement of this workflow, we've done a lot of that heavy lifting for you. What I know about Travel Joy is you got to set up all that workflow, right? You know, I've done the training for you guys for Travel Joy. We've done a lot of that heavy lifting for you inside of this system. I'm going to pause, see if there's any questions. Um, and uh, I will, I'm, I'm prepared to answer any questions, but really, this is really, when we talk about these metrics, this is really what we're talking about is tracking how you get people into inquiry. How many people, again, the number of no-shows, the number of shows really is a reflection of the automation that you have on booked appointments, right? We've built, we've built a whole no-show automation that's available in the system. We have an automation that's already, uh, that sends out reminders for calls once they're booked. We also have the automation. If you get stomach, you know, stomach cramps, I want, you know, I want to charge 250, but now I've got to create the invoice and maybe I shouldn't send it, right? We do all of that for you as well. So we really are trying to take the stickiness of tracking this and then also creating these sort of things that make people uh, not want to do the thing uh, kind of difficult as well. All right. But no volume, couldn't get it with sound on phone. All right, so I'll take a look at that. So thanks for letting me know. Um, then really that's, if there are no questions about the system, what I wanna just sort of wrap up because we're about 10 minutes left um, before I've got a, a 
just to, to go to our VIP session is just kind of give you guys a summary of what we went over and kind of give you some, some ideas as to what the next steps are um, if you want to take this further. So we've gone over this week, we've gone over these three shifts, right? Automate what you need to standardize as much as you can so it's not a free for all every time you do a travel request process, right? You know, particularly if you're not charging, do not create a custom process for every client you work with. Standardize as much as it possible as you possibly can. Make it easy for the client to um, to get on your books. Make it easy for the client to say yes, for them to qualify themselves and confirm themselves that you're the right person. Don't work with everybody. Don't don't try and work with everybody. Create a box, right? Stay within the box when it comes to defining your who. Have a criteria by which you define your who. And then make sure that you have offers. So when you have your who and you've spent that effort of, you know, building relationships with them and you're ready to do hard selling that you have something to sell to them above and beyond your commission-based trips. Create service models that ensure that you get paid upfront for your expertise and the services that you provide. All right. We have about eight minutes. Um, so this is a, a just a recap of what we went over today. We've gone over the travel request process, key conversations that you should be having in your travel business designing a client and an advisor experience that makes it easy for you to operate this workflow, easy for your client to interact with the workflow and make sure that you've created a system that really allows you to mitigate your risk from a payment perspective and then also promote on purpose, right? Don't leave it for chance. Like referrals are great, but promote your services on, on, on purpose. I think everybody does a great job of promoting their, their trips and maybe there's still some room for improvement there, but really focus on the activity before the trip, all of that activity and promoting those activities before the trip, all right? So really what's next? So if you, um, we're gonna actually have a special uh, training tomorrow to really talk to you about what's next. So look out for the invitation for that. We're going to be having a special webinar on how do you take this to the next level, right? So if you are in trial, certainly I want you to finish out the trial. But for those of you who maybe you've got a system and you're happy with the system, how do you really get in front of doing inquiries? How do you get more inquiries? So you're going to want to join me uh, tomorrow. And then I'm going to open it up for questions if there are any questions on here. So I think, uh, thanks Hazel for letting me know about no sound. So was there no sound on the YouTube or I wonder where there was no sound? I'll have to, I'll have to check that. It must be on the YouTube. All right. Okay, Jocelyn has a question in the inbox. Oh, okay, thank you. Can you host your website in the system? Yes, you absolutely can. Let me show you that really quick. So underneath sites, what we talked about, I think it was on Monday, we talked about sort of these funnels, right? And so we give you this, uh, this funnel out the box, the request funnel, but then your website, you can host, um, uh, I don't have a website example, but yes, you can, Post. There's two types of sites. You can do a site directly here, but if you'd like to upgrade and um, have a WordPress site, you can also do a WordPress yeah. site. Um, yep, you can host it here. And there's no additional cost if you do the hosting here, but if you want to do a web uh, WordPress, there is an additional cost for the WordPress. How do you structure your terms and conditions? So that's a really great question. I'm not an attorney. Um, so I have a partner that um, who specializes in, she works with attorneys, um, that company works with attorneys, and they uh, do all of the legal, uh, <laughs> legal terms and agreements that you need to have. So we have partnerships with people who specialize in turn with attorneys. So 
we, uh, um, I don't, I personally don't get in the business of defining like the types of terms, but what I will tell you is you need them. Um, so I'll tell you the types of terms that you need to do. So we partner with Travel Industry Solutions um, on their terms. If you're interested in, she's actually going to be speaking to our group next month, but they have a, they have three, they have a lot of terms, but the three major terms that she focuses on is a terms and conditions, um, which is really a long terms that talks about all of your, uh, your refund policy, your fee structure, how you handle refunds, how you, you know, your jurisdiction, all of that's handled in the terms uh, and conditions document. And these are traveler terms. And then there's uh, a, what she calls a, ter a traveler service agreement, which is really a short term that really sets the stage for confirming that the client has read the long terms. You need an insurance uh, waiver. Those are important. You're in the internet space. You need to have a, a website terms of use. You need to have a privacy policy. You need to have a cookie policy. Like there's all these sort of legal agreements that you have. And I'm, I'm not an attorney. So I, I partner with people who know all of these laws and what you need to have and all of that. Um, so we have products and relationships with them and we do try to extend the discounts through that. So we do have a discount if you do decide to go with um, Travel Industry Solutions. We have a coupon code if you'd like to get that. And then we have another uh, partner that we use as well. Um, I absolutely recommend errors and emissions insurance. You should not be in business and not have your own errors and emissions insurance policy. All right. Um, so are you saying that we can move our website to the system? I absolutely am saying that. Yep. <laughs> I'm using we believe format with Voyager. Would that look and feel remain the same, but the the host would um, just be different? Um, yes and no. So I've actually been working with the client who has Voyager. Um, love Richard's product. Um, love the solution that he's done. So I'm certainly not trying to say that he doesn't have a great product. However, um, it is it is a website builder. So Weebly is just a website builder like Wix is, like GoDaddy. And so we have a similar type of builder. I think our builder is a little bit better. We have templates that you can do so you can create um, your site with templates. We will be offering travel specific templates in the future. But if you're accustomed to dragging and dropping elements, I teach you how to drag and drop and how to manipulate elements in the funnel training that I do and that same concept is used in the website builder. So I will teach you how to do that. Can I provide you recommendations for the partners? So uh, what is the price for, um, Donica, tell me at the website for the price, for the website, what do you mean? So you get the website functionality inside of Travel Pro Suite. It comes with the, with the suite. What we'll be delivering is just like we deliver funnels here in the future, we will be delivering you guys travel specific website, uh, travel specific websites that you can just drag and drop your elements. So templates that are geared for travel advisors. There are a few in our, um, generic out of the box um, website builder, but they're not as fancy as we're gonna make them. So for, if you're asking the price for Travel Pro Suite, the price is $97 a month for our basic level. Um, and so again, that includes the websites in here, it includes all of what we've talked about. And Maria, you asked for, um, recommendations for partners. Yeah. So for, for, for terms and conditions, partner recommendations is travel. Um, and I should have had the link there, but it's travel industry solutions. Um, send me an email and then I'll send you the link to it with the coupon code. Cause there is a coupon code that you guys can then apply. And I think you guys get like 10% off or you get, you get the, the setup fee waived. So um, send me an email and I'll send that link out to you guys. All right. 
We are at the bottom of the hour. And listen, as always, I have enjoyed this month's workshop. Look out for an invitation to learn all about sort of the next steps in your marketing game. If you really want to take your business to the next level, we'll be talking all about that in a special edition tomorrow. And um, I'm going to see the VIPers in the next room. And then what I will say is have a great rest of your week. If you're a mom, have a great Mother's Day. And I will see you all next month. If you decide to join us in next month, sweet success in the VIPers. I will see you in the next session. You guys have a great rest of your week. Talk to you soon.